Okay, so the long name is feedback from the output of the ALU to the input of the ALU. Okay. We call this whole thing forwarding. Which can be a little bit of a misleading name. It looks like we're actually sending it backwards, right? But what forwarding means is that we're able to forward it to the next clock cycle uh, such that a subsequent instruction can use it immediately. solution for sure. Yeah. Um, we have, uh, so I, I mentioned that you don't get this for free. What you need is a, a much more complex control system. to know in advance. That's right. So um, when we're decoding the ad, there's no problem, right? But we, we have to keep track of, by the way, what register is this writing to? Yeah. Then when we're decoding uh, the subsequent instruction, the sub, right? we say, aha, this instru instruction needs the result from R1. The previous instruction is generating that result, so we would have to assert some new control signal. And that control signal is in part going to be responsible for governing what happens at this input. One of the things that I talked about in a previous lecture is we have this notion of a multiplexer. Right? And the multiplexer can select which input to send to the output of the box. So, where one of the other options might be the register. And this is the out of LU. So you can feed back from one instruction, but what about where the, the Zor uses the R1? Because that hasn't written back yet. Love how this, the, you guys asked the questions at the perfect time. Great observation. Let me um, let me pause and uh, see if there's any questions about what I'm showing here. Yes. Can you repeat the point about the multiplexer? So the multiplexer can choose what input to feed back in, or yeah. So what's a what's a good digital analogy for a, a, a multiplexer or a software analogy of, of a multiplexer? Um, Yeah, it's like a switch statement, basically, right? Where you have a choice of many different uh, options coming in, you evaluate which of the conditions is true, and then you do some sort of operation only on one of the cases, okay? So we have a switch statement that basically says, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this, and we're only gonna send one of those values to the input of the ALU. So it's a many to one mapping. that multiplexer has to be controlled by something, and so we have some control lines that determine uh, what, which one of the inputs we want to pass to the output of the box. And that's going to take more time to determine which one to pass? Uh, there is a, um, a fairly uh, small increase in delay. Multiplexers are very, very um, fast. Um, if, think of it as a switch network, basically. Um, so uh, saying, okay, give me uh, item two, and item two goes out. Okay. So uh, there's not a huge latency for this multiplexer, whether it has two inputs or four inputs or eight inputs, um, it takes about the same amount of time.
Okay. So, Nick's observation is accurate that we need to implement forwarding not just from the exact stage. Because what's happening here in the XOR? Okay. The XOR uses the results from the two previous instructions. So when the execute, or when the exclusive OR is in the execute phase of the pipeline, we need to do the R1 minus R2. It's forwarded. But we also need the other value, which has still not been written back to the register file. still in the pipeline now. We've passed it from the end of the ALU, now it's sitting in some buffer somewhere here, waiting to get committed in the right back station clock cycle five. in some buffer and we need to get it into execute. Yep. So this is again a buffer. What does that look like in the diagram going from memory to execute? Would that just go into the MUX? No, uh, yeah, so there would be a separate entrance into the MUX. From memory. Oh, from from a, a latch basically that sits between the oh, um, between memory and the right back stage. Okay, so before the memory, there's some kind of latch. There's going to be latches at each of these stages to hold intermediate okay, results. Okay, so once the result is ready, it goes into a latch. Then on the next clock cycle, we advance it from that latch to the next latch. Yeah. What's a latch? Okay, so um, it basically holds something. It just holds value. So it's like a buffer. It's a buffer. It's a buffer. <laughs> cool. Well, I just want to well, a latch is a more digital logic term than buffer. Right. Right. Where okay. do these latches or buffers exist? I'm having a hard time visualizing this. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so um, let me uh, try and show a a much cleaner picture than what I showed when I first introduced what the data path was. Okay, so um, fetch and decode aren't particularly interesting here for this. I'm gonna try and be precise with my naming. I'm gonna call that buffer EXMEM because it sits in between the exact execute stage and the mem stage. Okay. There's also a buffer here. That will call mem right back because it's in between those two stages. So now we have a pretty complex input network to our ALU. Okay. Our choices are okay, the registers. We also have the instruction, and it says add sub whatever it is. Now, this is my
my multiplexer, I'll call it MUX0. There's another one. Call that MUX1. Yeah. So, for instance, from the MUX1 point of view, we can take outputs from a variety of, or inputs from a variety of locations. We can have, this could be an immediate value, something like add R1, R1, pound sign 1, right, if you're going to use it for a loop increment or something. That immediate value is stored directly in the instruction. We can have a register. This is the normal case, right? We can have the output of this latch. And we can also have the output of this latch. So I didn't have to cross anything, but I failed. Okay. Now, we obviously don't want all of these all together at the same time. So that's, this is why we have this mini to one mapping. Only one of those goes to the input of the ALU. So we only use either an immediate value or the register or the output of buffer min write back or the output of buffer execute min. In these buffers? Yeah. Yeah, so the output of the uh, ALU stage is always saved in this buffer at the, at the end of that clock cycle. And then on the next clock cycle, we advance it to here if it's supposed to advance. There are cases where it isn't supposed to advance. We'll get there next. So this buffer actually has a multiplexer in front of it governing what that input to that is as well. And all of these multiplexers are governed or controlled by our more complex control system. Yeah. The, the real magic of the microprocessor is the control unit. Um, ALUs are a dime a dozen, right? Um, register files, not that complicated. Memory units, not terribly interesting. It's the control unit that makes them all work in harmony, right? I don't want to take anything away from them. It's like each of these are individual musicians, right? But we have the composer and the conductor, which is our control unit, making that an orchestra rather than just an independent set of musicians. Okay. Okay. Question. Oh, do we also need to worry about latches between fetch, decode, and exec? Yeah, they're there. Um, uh, primarily because we're passing the instruction from one stage to the next. These are not data values, they're actually instruction values, control signals. That you know. So we're, we're keeping track of the control and the data for each instruction and each cycle via these latches and buffers. Okay. So the good news is I'm not going to ask you to design the control unit. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's obviously possible. Um, these processors exist, and they work, and they're pipeline. Okay, so it, um, it's a task that I, uh, I think is really interesting, uh, but probably at a level that is beyond what I intend to do with this course. So, forwarding is employed at many stages of the, or at more than one stage of the pipeline. So here we're able to forward from the output of the mem stage, the mem write back buffer. Okay. And that can go to the input of the ALU that we've shown over here. Right. 
So we can also have the output of the AOU go directly to the input. And uh, you know, I should be clear, uh, with the exception of the immediate value, um, the upper multiplexer would have the same inputs. Meaning, for instance, I could swap R4 and R1 here, right? And that would change which input it went into on the ALU. I can't swap the position of the immediate because the ARM instruction set artificial only allows the second operand to be an immediate value, not the first. Okay. Happy people?